Okay, so this is chapter six um, of The Future of the Oceans by Wolfgang Friedman, uh, published in 1971. Here, here's the tagline. The oceans are the common heritage of mankind. Some of the greatest sources of wealth lie at the bottom of the sea, but unleashed technology and the world's race for military and economic control can spell disaster. Okay, so chapter six is Towards an International Ocean Bed Control, page 62, and it ends, um, oh, it's a long one, 20 pages. Yeah, 20 pages, all right, let's try. We might have to do this in two bits. The countries involved in the race for the progressive partition of the ocean bed have, have unequal handicaps. Only a small number of states is favoured geographically and technologically. These states tend to attract a number of client states who hope to profit from their association with the major corporate enterprises of the advantaged countries. Every year, more exploratory licences are granted by the major maritime and technologically advanced powers. Obviously, every state with the necessary technological equipment and scientific know-how will seek to extend the area over which it controls the granting of exploratory permits, if only to counter corresponding moves by other coastal states. Already on the American continental slope, exploration permits have, granted, have been granted for areas extending as far as 300 miles from the coast, at depths ranging from 198 metres to 1,525 metres, and the United States Draft Convention of August 1970 specifically prote protects investments made up to the date when the treaty will come into force. Thus, for each year that elapses without the establishment of some international control, the domain of vested interests expands and the area to which an international regime might be applicable shrinks. Naturally, the individual and organisations who oppose any effective international control and seek to maximise the area of exclusive national jurisdiction describe as premature the establishment of such authority. In 1967, a subcommittee of the United States House of Representatives reported that it would be, it would be precipitate, unwise and possibly injurious to, to the objectives that both the United States and the United Nations have in common to reach a decision at this time regarding a matter that vi vitally affects the welfare of future generations. The committee also specifically opposed United States opposed United States support for the vesting of title to the seabed, the ocean floor or ocean resources in any existing or new organisation. It concluded that the hasty action in this field could create more problems than it will solve or avert. In an interim report issued in July 1968, the Committee on Deep Sea Mineral Resources of the Latin American branch of the International Law Association expressed its opposition to any supranational authority with the power to grant or deny concessions. In order for its full implications to be appreciated, this portion has to be read in junction, conjunction with the report issued by the National Petroleum Council in, Council in 1969, which stated its firm and carefully considered conclusion that the United States, in common with other coastal nations, now has exclusive jurisdiction over the natural resources of the submerged continental mass seaward to where the submerged portion of the mass meets the abyssal ocean floor. The nationalistic approach that has been predominant in the attitudes of the legislators, the major industrial interests and a considerable number of legal scholars clearly seeks to minimise the area of international jurisdiction or to exclude altogether any international control over the ocean bed. Their minimum demands extend the exclusive jurisdiction of the coastal states to the edge of the continental margin so that any possible international commission would be confined to the abyssal depths. While a permanent solution is delayed, exploratory and exploitation licences are issued to that limit in, in the expectation that licences or titles once granted would not be abandoned by the state concerned. Although the problem of the future exploitation of deep sea resources and the need for some international authority have been stated in previous decades, it was Ambassador Arvid Pardo Pardo's speech to the United Nations in 1967 that started a worldwide discussion of the subject. After an... Sorry, let me just mark that up.
Okay, so worldwide discussion of the subject. After an extensive survey of the growing importance of seabed resources and the impact, manner and control of their exploitation on man's political and economic future, Mr Pardo introduced a draft resolution whose most important aspects were, one, the inclusion of the seabed and the ocean floor beyond the limits of present national jurisdiction from national appropriation, two, the establishment of an international agency to regulate, supervise and control all ocean bed activities beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. The first proposition was spelled out in the following four principles. One, the seabed and the ocean floor underlying the seas beyond the limits of present national jurisdiction are not subject to national appropriation in any manner whatsoever. Two, the exploration of the seabed and, and the ocean floor underlying the seas beyond the limit of present national jurisdiction shall be undertaken in a manner consistent with the principles and purpose of the ca Charter of the United Nations. Three, the use of the seabed and the ocean floor underlying the seas beyond the limit of present national jurisdiction and their economic exploitation shall be undertaken with the aim of safeguarding the interests of mankind. The net financial benefits derived from the use and exploitation of the seabed and the ocean floor shall be used primarily to promote the development of poor countries. Four, the seabed and the ocean floor underlying the seas beyond the limits of present national jurisdiction shall be reserved exclusively for peaceful purposes in perp perpetuity. The function of the proposed international agency were described as follows. One, to assume jurisdiction as a trustee for all countries over the seabed and the ocean floor underlying the seas beyond the limits of present national jurisdiction. Two, to regulate, supervise and control all activities thereon. Three, to ensure that the activities undertaken conform to the principles of the provision of the proposed treaty. The Pardo proposals triggered a series of conferences, symposia, monographs and further proposals, both official and unofficial. Before discussing the main aspects of the Pardo resolution, we will briefly analyse its two most important official sequels. One, the step te steps taken by the United Nations itself. Two, the announcement made by President Nixon on May 23rd, 1970 regarding United States ocean policy followed by a draft convention presented to the United Nations Seabed Committee in August. In December 1967, the General Assembly of the United Nations established an ad hoc committee consisting of 35 members to study the scope and various aspects of the Pardo idea. The special committee met three times and submitted a report that indicated unanimous approval of the President's call for an international decade of ocean exploration and a general and general agreement on the establishment of a submarine area beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. But there was sharp division over the question of creating an international agency to control ocean bed activities, with the apparently accidental exception of Japan. All the major industrial powers, both capitalist and socialist, either voted against the setting up of a permanent committee to study the establishment of an international ocean bed authority, or abstained from voting, which amounts to the same thing, though with less candour. This vote clearly showed that none of the major powers was prepared to commit itself to an international control authority. In December 1968, as a result of the Special Committee's report, the General Assembly established a perma permanent committee composed of 42 states for the peaceful uses of the seabed and the ocean floor beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. 112 na nations voted favourably, none against, and there were seven abstentions, which included the Soviet Union and two Soviet republics with separate United Nations votes. The committee was instructed to study the legal principles and norms that would promote international cooperation in the ex exploration and use of the seabed and the subsoil, subsoil beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. Two, to study the means of encouraging the exploitation and use of the resources of, of this area in the light of foreseeable technological developments and economic implications, bearing in mind the fact that such exploitation should benefit mankind as a whole. Three, to review and stimulate the exchange and widest possible dissemination of scientific knowledge on the subject. Four, Four, 
to examine proposals to prevent marine pollution that may result from resource exploration and exploitation. In a further resolution, the committee was instructed to study the question of reserving the seabed for exclusively peaceful purposes. Finally, the General Assembly requested the Secretary General to undertake a study of the question of appropriate international machinery, taking into special consideration the interests and needs of the developing countries. The Seabed Committee, which divided itself into subcommittees to deal with economic, technical and legal problems, submitted a report to the first committee of the General Assembly in 1969, which resulted in certain resolutions in the 24th session. Since neither the Seabed Committee nor the General Assembly have as yet arrived at any specific operational recommendations, it may suffice to br briefly summarise the general tenor of the recommendations. The legal subcommittee of the seabed committee agreed that some area of the seabed should remain outside the limit of national jurisdiction and appropriation, but there was no, no concurrence on the major problem of establishing a precise boundary for this area. The counterpart concept that the seabed and subsoil beyond the limits of national jurisdiction are common heritage of mankind are the common heritage of mankind was widely supported but not acceptable to all. There was also general agreement on the reservation of the seabed for peaceful purposes, but not on the geographical limits for the application of the principle or on, or on the scope of the prohibition of activities. Again, some general consensus emerged on the need for the establishment of a regime on the use of the resources for the benefit of mankind, irrespective of the geographical location of states and taking into account the special interests and needs of the developing countries. But the character, scope and area of such a regime were not defined. The principles of freedom, non-discrimination, international cooperation and non-interference with fundamental scientific research were affirmed, but a di distinction was made between scientific research and commercial exploration. The General Assembly affirmed these general and in many ways ambiguous expressions of opinion. It also requested the Secretary General to ascertain the views requested the Secretary General to ascertain the views of the member states on the desirability of convening at an early date a conference on the law of the sea to review the regimes of the high seas, the continental shelf, the territorial seas and the contiguous zones, fishing and conservation of the living resources of the high seas, particularly in order to arrive at a clear, precise and internationally accepted definition of the area of the seabed an ocean floor which lies beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, the type of international regime to be established for that area. In another resolution adopted at the same meeting in January 1970, a divided assembly declared that, pending the establishment of the aforementioned international regime, a states and persons physical and jur jur juridical, juridical are bound to refrain from all activities of export exploitation of the resources of the area of the sub of the seabed and ocean floor and the subsoil thereof beyond the limits of national jurisdiction no claim to any part of that area or its resources shall be recognized the major powers dissented from this resolution whose significance in any event limited as long as the limits of the national jurisdiction are not clearly defined but the refusal of the major powers to assent to any moratorium indicates clearly enough their reluctance to limit the exploration and exploitation of areas they consider to be within the limits of national jurisdiction, pending the conclusion of any international treaty that would define and limit such jurisdiction. The General Assembly invited the Seabed Committee to continue its work and to submit a draft declaration on the principles of international cooperation in the exploration and use of the seabed and subsoil and on the economic and technical conditions that are to govern the exploitation of their resources. Held in the summer of 1970, the Geneva session of the Seabed Committee ended in complete deadlock. The Latin American states were unwilling to abandon or restrict their claims to absolute sovereignty over a 200 mile zone. The USSR displayed its customary aversion to an international authority equipped with effective powers. The United States draft treaty did not even reach the stage of serious discussion. Any appraisal of the briefly outlined work of the United Nations in this area must take the following points into consideration. It has not yet reached the stage of any concrete operative proposals. Two, any resolution that might be passed 
by the General Assembly would not be directly legally binding upon the, the member states, but would have only, mor only moral force. The resolution might at best state certain principles from which it would henceforth be somewhat more difficult for any one member of the United Nations to depart than before. C. Any legal commitment would have to follow from a treaty or a series of treaties as they might result from future sea law conferences. But this would be a prolonged and highly complicated process and it is doubtful that it would attain even the minimum objection, objective of revising the first article of the Geneva Convention in order to fix the boundaries of the continental shelf. In the meantime, it is to be feared that within the limits of technological and commercial feasibility, the coastal states will proceed with the utmost expansion of national claims and interests. The Nixon announcement on the United States ocean policy. Whew. Okay, so we're on page 70. I'm going to carry on going. Since the effective decision-making power still rests overwhelmingly with each country, and in this area, particularly with the major, major industrially, and industrially and technologically advanced coastal states, President Nixon at Nixon's announcement of the United States Ocean Policy and the subsequent draft convention are of special importance. But in assessing their implications, we must bear in mind that the President of the United States, however powerful, cannot make a law without the ap approval of Congress, and that until now the preliminary studies and statement formulated both by the Senate and the House of Representatives have been overwhelmingly in favour of the expansion of the United States claims and against any effective international authority limiting or controlling such expansion. In order to become effective between nations, the draft convention would first have to pass the hurdles of congressional legislation and then obtain sufficiently widespread acceptance to lay the foundation for an international treaty. Such a treaty would have to be approved by a two-thirds majority of the Senate to become binding on the United States, and at present it cannot be assumed that the policy statement represents government policy in spite of the weight lent to it by the President's name. The sharp differences of opinion between the Department of State and the Department of Defense and the Depart sorry, the Department and the Department of the Interior have already been noted. And in his summary accompanying the draft United States Convention, the legal advisor to the Department of State admitted that it does not necessarily represent definitive views of the United States government. The United States initiative nevertheless constitutes the first modest attempt to redirect a race that during the past quarter of a century has been entirely in one direction, the outward and downward expansion of national claims to the seas at the expense of international freedoms. First, the President of the United States affirms that decisions of momentous importance face, man face mankind about whether the oceans will be used rationally and equitably and for the benefit of mankind, or whether they will become an arena of unrestrained exploitation and conflicting jurisdictional claims in which even the most advantaged states will be losers. But such sentiments have been uttered before. By President Johnson in 1966, the more important are the concrete proposals to stem the unstrained unrestrained exploitation and conflicting jurisdictional claims spelled out in the draft convention of August 3rd, 1970. The first welcome propose, proposal, so let's see. The first welcome proposal is to confine the continental shelf proper to a depth of 200 meters, which exceeds only slightly the 100 fathom, 183 meter limit of the Truman Proclamation to obligate all nations to renounce claims beyond this depth and to agree to regard the resources of the high seas beyond as the common heritage of mankind. Second, the United States proposal proposes an international regime for the exploitation of seabed resources beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. An international seabed resources authority is to have power to collect mineral royalties for international community purposes particularly economic assistance to, to developing economic assistance to developing countries. It is also to establish rules to protect other uses of the ocean bed and to prevent pollution. On the other hand, it is to assure the integrity of the investment necessary for such exploitation. A return to a strict 200 meter depth of the continental shelf and the internationalization of the ocean bed and subsoil beyond would be nothing less than revolutionary. It would return national claims to the status of 20 to 25 years ago and greatly enlarge not only the mineral and other 
seabed resources available to mankind, but also the institutional and operational authority of the international community. The United States proposal does not go far, and it, it would presumably have little hope of adoption in con Congress or by other major coastal powers if it did. It therefore compromises between the clear-cut nationalist and internationalist approaches by proposing that coastal nations act as trustees for the international community in an international trusteeship zone consisting of the continental margins beyond the depth of 200 metres off their coast. For this immediate zone, a concept introduced by Professor Louis Henkin of Columbia University in 1968, the Nixon Statement and the Draft Convention go along with the continental margin concept sponsored by the American Petroleum Institute. Various congressional committees and both American and non-American legal scholars the crucial question, therefore, is what is meant by international trusteeship? The draft convention submitted by the United States to the United Nations Seabed Committee in August in 1970 bears out and clarifies the general statement made by President Nixon in the international trusteeship area. Article 27 says that each coastal state shall be responsible for a issuing, suspending and revoking mineral exploration and exploitation licenses b establishing work requirements provided that such requirements shall not be less than those specified in appendix a c ensuring that its licenses comply with the convention and if it deems it necessary applying standards to its licenses higher than or in addition to those required under this convention provided such standards are, are promptly communicated to the international seabed resource authority D, supervising its licenses and their activities. E, exercising civil and criminal jurisdictions over its license, licensees and persons acting on their behalf while engaged in exploration or exploitation. F, filing, filing reports with the International Seabed Resource Authority. G, collecting and transferring the International Seabed Resource Authority all payments required by this convention. H. Determining the allowable catch of the living resources of the seabed and prescribing other conservation measures regarding them. I. Enacting such laws and regulations as are necessary to perform the above function. Appendix A, to which Article 27 refers, distinguishes between non-exclusive exploration licences and exclusive exploitation licences. The latter alone give the right to undertake deep deep drilling for exploration or exploitation. As the authorising party, the coastal states must certify the operator's financial and technical competence and require him to conform to the terms of the licence. There are details provide prov there are detailed provisions concerning matters such as the size of the blocks to be licensed, the scale of the fees to be charged for exploration and the exploitation respectively the submission of work plans and data under exploitation licences and production plans prior to beginning commercial production. Particularly important from the standpoint of the interests of the international community is the proportion between 50% and 60, 66 anyway, percent of the revenues derived by the trustee states from license fees, rentals and other proceeds that would be handed over to the International Seabed Resource Authority to use for the benefit of all mankind, and particularly to promote the economic advancement of developing states parties to the Convention, irrespective, irrespective, irrespective of their geographic location. Article 5 of the draft further provides that a portion of these revenues shall be used through or in cooperation with other international or regional organisations to promote efficient, safe and economic exploitation of mineral, re mineral resources of the seabed, to promote research on, on means to protect the marine environment, to advance other international efforts designed to promote safe and efficient use of the marine environment, to promote development of knowledge of the international seabed area and to provide technical assistance to contracting parties or their nationals for these purposes without discrimination. A second important feature of the draft convention as spelled out in Appendix A provides for the liability of both the operator and the authorising state for damages to other uses of the marine environment and for the cost of restoration. 
Moreover, in accordance with the standards laid down in the Convention for Seabed Exploration, the licensing state will have the power to revoke a license in the case of violation of any of the conditions imposed upon the licensee. The United States draft generally clarifies the points left vague in the Nixon statement. International trusteeship is not just a thin disguise for unlimited power of the coastal states to do what it likes in the intermediate zone, apart from an arbitrary financial handout to the international community. It subjects the intermediate zone and the coastal state responsible for its administration to the general standards of the convention and provides for a minimum 50% for the international community and the revenues derived from this zone. Anything less would, of course, leave the area between the continental shelf and the edge of the continental margin open to the most divergent practices, greatly increase the danger of pollution and destruction of marine life and threaten the other international uses of the sea. From the point of view of international committee interest, a major drawback of the United States draft is its consistency with the attitude taken in the United Nations debates by the developed countries in refusing to impose a moratorium and its specific protection of investments made until the proposed treaty came into force. Since such a treaty is at best some years away, it means that with every day that passes, the scope and area of licenses granted by coastal states expands and the area left to international con control, if and when a treaty comes into force, is proportionally reduced. British and French government proposals submitted to the United Nations Seabed Committee in the summer of 1970 generally support the United States government's attitude to the major aspects of seabed control. They are, however, far less detailed and definitive than the United States uh, draft convention. In particular, they fail to set a strict limit for the continental shelf, without which it is impossible to define the limits of national jurisdiction. Instead, the British working class paper simply states that the agreement should be should define the area in which the international regime is to apply and that the international body to be created should administer appropriate parts of the regime. The British and French proposals generally agree on the need for an international agreement to lay down strict standards with regard to pollution control, conservation of natural resources, prevention of unjustifiable interference with navigation and fishing and the allocation of some portion of the revenues derived from licensing fees to the landlocked and developing nations, the countries. Unlike the United Nations draft, both the British and French proposals would have licensed licenses issued to states only, which in turn would sub-license operators within the area and be responsible for compliance with minimum standards of efficiency, such as conservation and pollution prevention. The French proposal makes a distinction between two types of ocean bed operations. The first, mining with mobile equipment, would be open to any state on a non-exclusive basis and subject simply to registration with an international organisation and compliance with international regulations, safeguarding the freedom of the seas, protecting against pollution and so on. The second, op the second operations that entail the use of fixed installations, would be far more closely controlled by the international authority, which would grant licences to states to states for specific areas and given a period of time. The French proposal also lays down that no state may claim a monopoly of areas adjacent to its continental shelf. The French proposal would not put the assessment and collection of part of the revenues for the benefit of development and, and landlocked countries in the hands of the international authority but would make states levy a tax on sub-licensed companies for this purpose. Thus, at least the British and French governments give general support to a meaningful international regime, but without early agreements on the precise limits of national jurisdiction as they are proposed only by the United States Draft Convention, the jurisdiction of any international ocean bed authority will remain shadowy and contract from year to year while states continue to expand the area of their national jurisdiction. Okay, the limits of national jurisdiction. The Maltese proposal, the United Nations debates and the United States proposal all agree on the necessary necessity of some kind of 
international control authority over an, uh, an area of the ocean bed determined to be beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. The first task then is a redefinition of the limits of national jurisdiction that will draw precise boundaries between the areas of national and international control. At the very last, this implies total rejection of the division of the ocean bed among the coastal states according to the equidistance principle. An international control area might be acceptable to those who advocate exclusive national jurisdiction up to the edge of the continental shelf. But as we have already seen, the exploitation of deep sea resources, generally at depths exceeding 5,000 metres, will be of relatively little importance in the future and would make a negligible contribution to any adjustment of revenue between developed and developing countries. Dr. Frank Lecoeur has estimated that the revenue from taxes on profits derived from exploitation of deep sea ocean metals would represent only a little more than 0.25% of the world's gross national product and only about 0.2% of the gross national product of the developing nations, based on 1967 figures. If divided equally among the 1.6 billion people of the developing countries, it would amount to 41 cents a head. It is possible that other others might make somewhat more optimistic estimates, but there can be no serious disagreement that an international ocean regime limited to the abyssal depths of the ocean bed would hardly be worth setting up. Its resources would be so negligible compared with those derived by the major coastal states from the continental margins that it would be likely to increase rather than reduce the international tension uh, and the sense of injustice felt by un underprivileged nations. The alternative offered by the United States proposal does reintroduce the strict depth limit for the continental shelf. Its potential value on a basis for an international ocean bed regime, which would have limited authority over the area between the continental shelf and the remainder of the continental margin, and full authority over the deep ocean bed, will depend largely on the portion of the revenue to be allotted to international purposes, as well as on the stringency of the conditions in, imposed on the licensees in the intermediate zone. Another approach advocate, advocated by Professor Andrassy and the Commission to study the organisation of peace in its... Ooh. Yeah, so my granddad was a pacifist and a humanist. So, um, you know, he mentions names. That's why. So, Professor Andrassy... The Commission recommends a 200... Okay, so... The United Nations and the bed of the sea, too, would redefine the continental shelf by a combination of depth and width limit, beyond which the ocean bed would be outside national jurisdiction. The Commission recommends a 200 metre depth or a 50 mile distance from the coast, whichever gives most to the coastal state. Professor Andrassy advocates a distance of 30 miles from the coast and beyond this limit to a depth of 200 metres. Professor Hen Henkin argues for a 200 metre isobath with a minimum shelf for all nations of a determined number of miles from the coast, together with a buffer zone in which coastal states would have mining privileges. This last proposal would, uh, was adopted with some modifications by the United States Draft Convention. Whatever the precise delimitations or combinations between depth and distance, the essential feature of all these proposals is their strict definition of the limits of national jurisdiction without which no ordering of the complex problems of the ocean bed is possible. The opposition to international control centres on the assertion that national interests must prevail over international utopias and that it would be foolhardy for countries such as the United States to forego any exclusive rights over portions of the ocean bed claimed to be within the national jurisdiction for the sake of the world community. The opposition will become louder as political crises threaten the supply of oil from the Middle East or nationalise foreign um, mining in interests in Latin America.
such arguments have short-term appeal, but they are greatly outweighed by the international chaos that will be an, an, an inevitable consequence of present trends. In the first place, there are contradictions even with different countries. In the United States, for example, the State Department's quest for some degree of international order is opposed by the Department of, Internet Inter of the Interior, with favour which favours the claims of national oil and other industrial interests, but it is strongly supported by the Defence Department, which in the tradition of the major naval powers encourages a narrow national jurisdiction for the sake of maximum mobility on the ocean. Closely linked with the, with the first is the second argument that the extension of national jurisdiction is a game that two and more than two can play. The expansion of national claims by one coastal power will inevitably be met by equal or greater claims of other coastal powers, including potentially hostile ones. In many cases, the disadvantages of greatly restricted access to the seas claimed to be within national jurisdiction of, other, of another state will more than outweigh the advantages gained by an extension of national jurisdiction. Nor is this whole issue simply a matter of conflict between developed and developing countries. Landlocked states generally favour an international regime which would give them some share in, in the resources of the sea. Those economically underdeveloped states with a rich landmass extending under the sea might tend to favour a wider national jurisdiction, but since many of them are unable to exploit these resources on their own, they will in fact prefer an international regime to the alternative of total technological, economic and ultimately political dependence on one of the major industrial powers. The largely poor and undeveloped Latin American states now almost universally claim a 200 mile zone of territorial waters. This is not only to reserve fisheries and other resources for their exclusive national use, but as we have seen in some cases, it is based on the fear that the exploitation of seabed mineral resources may jeopardize the profitability of land-based mining, which is a vital source of income. The result of all these contradictory and conflicting claims can only be a general increase in international tension and confrontation. Even the most short-sighted advocates of national interest can hardly welcome a world in which groups of states will claim vast stretches of the seas around them as their own, while, other, while others extend seabed operations further and further outwards with the inevitable result of increasing curtailment of international fishing and navigation and the threat of confrontation at the bottom of the ocean. Today, realism becomes the madness of tomorrow. Great. Well, a bit out of date because it was written in 1971, but um, I'd be interested to find out what's happening now.